just for make sure we have the spelling correct, just mm -hmm. say your name and spell for us. Jan Koopman, K-O-O-P-M-A-N. Okay. Um, well, thanks for joining us mm -hmm. today, Jan. Uh, I'm just wondering, maybe we've been talking to other folks in this project, obviously mostly folks from the LGBT community, but also folks who would be called, uh, we would call allies. Mm -hmm. and consider yourself also sort of falling in the ally category. Um, could you maybe start off by talking a little bit about your own sort of uh, uh, kind of initiation into the LGBT community? I mean, what sort of brought you to sort of know and uh, be an ally for folks um, struggling for equality? Okay, well, I moved back to West Michigan in 1991 after having been a federal government employee for, oh, 15, 17 years. Came back to West Michigan where I grew up and I had been a federal employee and I didn't want to do government work anymore, but I knew about government. And what my husband and I had done when we were in Washington, D.C., we had gotten our kicks out of doing things like staying at shelters and soup kitchens, things like that, working with marginalized populations. Then when we made the decision to move to Grand Rapids, I needed to find a job. And I wanted to work in something that was around marginalized populations and somewhere where I could use my government experience. And this executive director of the AIDS Resource Center position came up. I thought about it and I thought, I think that's something I want to do. So I came to Grand Rapids in 91 and I really didn't know very much about HIV at all. And I had had friends in the LGBT community for a long time, but was not deeply involved in it. So I kind of fell into this situation where all of a sudden I was the front person on an issue very important to this community and an issue that in Grand Rapids, the LGBT community had been leading the HIV issue. So I immediately be began to form acquaintances in the community. And what's your sense of when um, uh, AIDS became sort of an issue for the LGBT community uh, in Grand Rapids. I mean, when were the first cases sort of The first known? cases were in the mid-80s, like 85, 86. And as I recall, I wasn't here, but what I've been told, then the county commission developed an a AIDS Council for the county. And Dr. Mack at the health department was part of the leadership in that. And so they developed this council to address the epidemic and they took representatives from a variety of the affected communities, from the LGBT community, from the health department, from mental health, from a lot of different areas and made this council to think about what we can do in Kent County to address HIV AIDS. So as AIDS Resource Center Executive Director, I immediately became a part of that AIDS council. Okay. On a more sort of, you know, day-to-day -day basis, was, what kind of work were you and the, the Resource Center mm -hmm. engaged in in the early 90s? Well, initially we were located on South Division next to Heartside Ministries, and so it was immediately downtown, and we were primarily involved initially in HIV care because when the AIDS cases, HIV AIDS cases started coming in Grand Rapids, there was no one to care for people. So, and that's how most AIDS organizations began as purely HIV care. So we had a food bank, we provided transportation, we did some financial assistance, we had a buddy program, which was very important those early days when so often HIV patients were shunned by their families, their churches, their workplaces. We developed a cadre of volunteers who got matched with people with HIV to provide support and care for them, so that it was initially all about care for the first few years, and then later we got into HIV prevention because we didn't want to see this thing grow exponentially, and funding at the federal level became available for HIV prevention programs, and so we expanded into HIV prevention and education also. In the 80s and early 90s and sort of the Reagan-Bush years, you know, mm -hmm. 
there's was, there was a lot of denial at the federal mm -hmm. level that this was even an issue, even mm -hmm. at, a, at a sort of a crisis level. Uh, and at the same time, there was kind of this framing uh, by folks that this was sort of just sort of labeled as sort of a gay disease. Mm -hmm. right? It was just very kind of it reactionary, was very... Haitians, homosexuals, and heroin users. Mm -hmm. You know, that was like the three H's was what people thought. Well. The Reagan administration, yes, Ronald Reagan never said the word AIDS publicly throughout his administration, but there were people within the administration who did recognize something needed to be done, and C. Everett Koop was the Surgeon General, and he, with a lot of opposition within the administration, insisted that I think everyone in America got sent a piece of mail about HIV and what it was about and how to prevent it and what the issues were. And so that, in, e in every regime, you can find allies somewhere. So C. Everett Koop did a lot within the administration, the Reagan administration, to do something. But yes, the um, Reagan administration, the Bush administration, first Bush, didn't do a whole lot about the issue. Well, and there wasn't a huge groundswell from the mainstream or from their base to do anything about it. So. Did you see sort of the, maybe some of the more kind of reactionary or um, uh, attitudes towards, particularly towards people who are HIV positive? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, obviously West Michigan has sort of this, you know, staunch kind of religious we, right sort of uh, sector. Yeah, yeah. Did that manifest, did that kind of, those sort of attitudes sort of manifest in, towards the, your organization mm -hmm. at the time in terms of? education and fundraising you were trying to do to? To, so, to some extent. Um, it was interesting, at the same time I came to the AIDS Resource Center, the Grand Rapids Area for Center for Ecumenism, GRACE, had the AIDS Pastoral Care Network, and I thought, hmm, I wonder what this is like, because I'm part of a faith community, too, and I thought, oh, is this a real reactionary type of organization? And, and they're not, they were very, good and caring and, and we had really strong relationships with the AIDS Pastoral Care Network, but there was a lot of ignorance around AIDS and unnecessary fear. And so part of the reason to do HIV education was to get people straight on what the real dangers were. I remember visiting a patient at one of the local hospitals here, he was, you know, connected to an IV tube, you know, and when the meal time came, the nurse left the tray outside the room. So this guy had to go drag his IV thing over to the door to get his food because the nurse was afraid to go in to the room with someone. And just like, oh my gosh, you know, this, this isn't the kind of precautions that make sense, you know. And we'd get the phone calls from people like, can't I get it from mosquitoes? Can I get it from toilet seats? And you try to educate people on that. And, and the fear about how you could get it led to things like funeral homes refusing to, to take the bodies. And so you started to identify these are the funeral homes that would. And uh, some church, you know, ministers would refuse to do the service. And then there were cases when I knew clients who had been so hurt by the church in the past that I remember one in particular said, and he wanted his funeral at some place that wasn't within 500 feet of a church. Well, then you try to find some place in downtown Grand Rapids that's more than 500 feet from a church. It got hard, but he, he, didn't, want any, he didn't want any connection to the church, and that was an experience of being very hurt by the church. And there were some um, philanthropists in town who wouldn't support us with any grants unless we were going to preach converting people from being gay, and you know, that wasn't what we were going to do. So there were avenues of funding that weren't accessible to us because of what we were doing. Mm -hmm. um, what was your observation with you know doing this kind of work, uh, education and prevention around HIV AIDS, mm -hmm. um, your relationship with the LGBT community? I mean, how did that issue HIV AIDS uh, impact the larger struggle for equality mm -hmm. for the LGBT community in Grand Rapids at the time? I mean, did you, 
was it? Did you see it any way? Is it a, as, as it, maybe it was a hindrance or was a, it was a, it was a help? I mean, did it did it sort of as a, was it something that galvanized people to fight harder oh, for equality? It certainly galvanized people. The LGBT community now had a common enemy that wasn't just straight people. The common enemy was this disease, and so people drew together. You know, there were I don't know if you recall incredible fundraisers at the gay bars and. All, all over town within the community for HIV because it was this common enemy. And then in doing HIV education, well, we often went into schools or churches and when we could identify clients who were willing to come in and talk and we had gay clients and they'd come to a church or a school, then people sometimes had to rethink some of the stereotypes they had about gay people. And so I think in some ways, HIV really helped the struggle for equality because people saw gay people as, as full, well-rounded human beings who take care of people and love people and are fine upstanding members of society. So people had to rethink their stereotypes. So in some ways, HIV was helpful in getting more people exposed to gay people as just full human beings like every one of us and that so much we share is so much more important than the little differences we had about things. So it was kind of instrumental in helping people think about LGBT equality. I was reading recently that I think at the, it was either the 1990 or 1991 Pride celebration they had as a guest speaker um, Cleve Jones, the, mm -hmm. who started the uh, AIDS project. Yeah. Right? What What was um, your recollection of of when kind of the the AIDS quilt project kind of first came to Grand Rapids, and and what impact did that mm -hmm. have on the community in terms of again awareness and organizing? Gosh, I'm I'm trying to think, go back so far with. Cleve, because I, I met him and became a friend back then in the early 90s, and we still keep in touch. And his parents have a cottage up north, and we go up there. I don't recall so much the quilt coming. Well, yes, the quilt came here to the community college in Ford Field House in 92, maybe. And the ceremony with the AIDS quilt that the tradition there is always that new panels are presented by family members and so we had I don't know, 15, 20 panel members presented there at Ford Fieldhouse and, and it was open to the public and other people who weren't just LGBT came to view that and then you read the stories. It's a very moving thing. It's, it was a brilliant strategy to have the quilt representing and telling the stories about people with HIV. It was very moving for people. And we also, we, we took a bus trip, we took a bus from Grand Rapids in 92 to Washington to the, to the AIDS quilt and again in 96. And it was just overwhelming to go in 90, 96 especially because if you're familiar with the mall, the quilt started on 15th Street, 14th Street, and went all the way to the Capitol and all the way between, you know, the whole area of the mall covered with quilt panels. And I know Cleve had been really, really disappointed previously that, you know, the president would never come to view the quilt. And it was Cleve's birthday in October of 96, and Bill and Hillary came on Cleve's birthday and looked at the quilt. And that was just a real wow thing to have that attention from the president. But it's just so overwhelming to see the whole thing together. And, and the history and the stories are overwhelming. And we made some quilt panels here for Grand Rapids people and then presented them in Washington and, and at other places, wherever there's a quilt display nearby. If we had a Quilt, new quilt panel, we'd go to Ann Arbor or Kalamazoo or wherever the display was and present new panels. And the last time we had a quilt display here was 2001 or two, 
at Grand Valley in the field house there. And Cleve came for that one also. Um, you knew Jerry Crane. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if you could speak a little bit about, you know, your, either your relationship with him or just, you know, your observation of, of that whole tragic circumstance. It was just, Jerry was a wonderful person. He was a fantastic music teacher in Byron Center. And he wanted to, he and his partner, Randy, wanted to demonstrate their commitment and were married by, or had a commitment ceremony by the um, minister at Westminster Presbyterian at the time. And somehow someone in Byron Center got hold of that and just started this awful movement to destroy Jerry. And Jerry is a sensitive person. He, he came from a very conservative religious background, so his parents and family had never really come to terms with his sexuality. And then um, we got through all that, and he was fired or whatever term they used. And, but it had been very, very stressful for him. And then I remember one day I was at work, and another friend called me and said, Jerry Crane's in the hospital. I said, what happened? He was at the apartment lounge the night before and had some sort of heart attack, I guess some sort of heart attack, heart episode, at the very first time he'd ever been to a gay bar. And then he passed away. And the funeral was incredible. It was at Westminster and it was packed, you know, the choir loft, everything was packed with people. And there were a lot of kids from the Byron Center High School who came. And there were other people from Byron Center, you know, you can't stereotype anything. There were good people in Byron Center who fought this and cared for Jerry and were embarrassed about what had happened there. And so there were good people came from Byron Center to that funeral, but it, it was so much stress. You know, in the end, the doctors or whoever said that the stress of this whole experience had been hard on Jerry's heart and contributed to the situation that killed him. And that was just so unnecessary and so sad. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, as someone who who concerns himself an ally? Mm -hmm. I just wonder if you could speak to the importance of uh, of being an ally. I mean, every social movement has uh, always involved and, and has always needed mm -hmm. people who weren't directly affected by yeah. the issue that the, uh, or the struggle that, mm -hmm. that was that was being organized around. So, as you know, as as an ally to the LGBT mm -hmm. community, you know. First of all, what, what, why did you in any way feel compelled to sort of be an ally and, mm -hmm. and what, is that, what has that meant for you to? Because it is just so wrong to discriminate against LGBT people. And there's a part of me that struggles with sometimes the fact that I'm, a, I'm also a person of faith. And, and I would get angry when I'd hear my LGBT friends stereotyping Christians, like all Christians are like this, Christians this, Christians that, they all hate us, blah, blah, blah. And I said, no, 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 there are good people who just if they're educated and understand can come around and be supportive. And so part of it has been my feeling that the, God's movement in the world, in his kingdom, her kingdom, whatever, is always toward inclusion. And Jesus always pulled in the marginalized people because it's his club, it's God's club, God's rule is that you believe, and that's it. And for 2,000 years, people, because we're people, have tried to keep the people we're not comfortable with out of that club. And I think God's just sick and tired of it and said, you know, it's my club, I make the rules, you guys quit messing with it. And so I'm, I want to work to get church, the church community inclusive, fully inclusive, and not just wishy-washy. We welcome everybody. I want churches to take a stand and say, we welcome LGBT into the community as full members of the church. That's important to me. And, and no movement has succeeded without allies. Yeah, um, 
as long as the movement, the LGBT equality movement was only made up of LGBT people or their parents or their kids or their close friends, people on the outside, on the other side, can look at you and say, well, yeah, you've got a vested interest. But when other allies come who aren't directly affected and just say, this discrimination is wrong, that strengthens the movement. And I want to be part, I want, I'm an ally because I think allies like me who aren't directly affected are part of that. And kind of looking at, you know, the history around the country with this mo movement, you know, it's interesting to find out, you know, that the, whether it was the Compton Cafe you know, uprising in 66 mm -hmm. or the Stonewall uprising, that the, the folks who were kind of at the front lines were, were, the, were the drag queens, were mm -hmm. the transgender folks, and um, in many ways they're still sort of the most marginalized within the LGBT community. Yeah. Uh, um, and there's even, that even is the case around sort of, uh, to some degree around, uh, you know, economics or uh, racial discrimination mm -hmm. and, and then, and then, you know, access to resources like, you know, for uh, HIV AIDS. Um, what's your sense uh, in this community uh, in terms of its response to mm -hmm. uh, the trans community in particular? I think the trans community is especially f hard for people to to get their head around to un to understand what that's all about because because it, it is different gender identity is different than sexual orientation and so it it's it's even harder for some people in the lesbian and gay people to get around the the whole idea of transgender but they belong together they belong as part of that whole movement around equality, around sexual and gender issues. Yeah. But, but it, is, it is hard. And there are, it's harder for people to come out about being trans. But you see a little more of it all the time. You see it nationally. I'm, there's an article in the New York Times this past weekend. There was a, a trans uh, running in the New York triathlon last weekend. Mm. You know, before he'd been in the triathlon as a female. Mm. So it, it happens, and it's, it's, going, it's going to increase and snowball so, so that people have a better understanding of transgender issues, too. Okay. And this is obviously, a, the project is to try to collect this history, mm -hmm. these stories about what's been going on in Grand Rapids over the last several decades. Um, but, but we're hoping that it has some mileage that people will use it for, you know, mm -hmm. future decades, you know, and so I'm just wondering if, if there are high school students, say for instance, who might be viewing these interviews 10, mm -hmm. 20, 30 years from now, mm -hmm. uh, who are themselves struggling around issues of their own identity or whether or not, or struggling around their friends who are struggling mm -hmm. with their identity. What maybe what words of encouragement might you have to a young person mm -hmm. about the importance again of being an ally mm -hmm. to folks who are uh, maybe not as accepted in this culture. As I recall, a number of years ago when my kids were in high school and they, were, they just started gay-straight gay alliances and the first gay-straight alliance in West Michigan was at my kid's high school, but it was led by a teacher who was an ally, you know, and because she had respect and wasn't seen as someone with a vested interest in this issue. She was an ally. She wasn't gay herself. That it seemed like it was almost a piece of cake to get this through my kids' high school. They had a GSA and no flack from parents, no, nothing. And it's still there and now GSAs are around the country, but boy, it's so easy for kids nowadays to forget that it wasn't that long ago there were no resources. I don't know if you know that right now or at least this summer, The Normal Heart, which was a Larry Kramer play early in the AIDS epidemic, reopened off Broadway. Mm. And it was about the early struggle around HIV and the discrimination and the hatred and the anger and all this act up stuff, fighting, fighting for support. And there was, there's a special $30 under 30 Thursday. So, 
someone's funded something so that on Thursday nights, anybody under 30 can get into that play for 30 bucks, which is a huge discount. And they interviewed young gay men who came out of seeing the normal heart on one of those Thursdays, and they had no idea that that's how it was like. And it was only 20, 30 years ago that that's what reality is. And they had just no idea about the struggle. And, and now they more appreciated what their older LGBT friends and allies had done 20, 30 years ago to make life a whole lot better for LGBT people now than it was. But you know, just when you think that everything's all hunky-dory in Grand Rapids now, then somebody gets beaten up in Grand Rapids who happen to have a gay pride shirt on. I mean, it's a good thing I wasn't wearing my gay pride shirt, yeah. But you know, it still happens, you know, and it's, it still can be scary to be gay in West Michigan and anywhere because people still do get beaten up. And I think the It Gets Better campaign that happened this year is, it's a wonderful thing, and it's a way to, you know, 20, 30 years ago, young kids sh should watch the It Gets Better videos, because you know, there's wonderful stories. And there's also some that, yeah, it gets better, but not much. You know, there's people who aren't convinced that it's all that great. It's still hard, but it's a whole lot better than it used to be. And, it, and really, you think it, it, when you're doing it, it seems like you make such slow progress, but now, 20 years later since I first came to Grand Rapids, there is a lot of change. It has really changed in Grand Rapids, though incidents still happen, and there are always gonna be people who use the F word and tease you and make jokes. That's always gonna happen anywhere, but it's better than it was, and there are protections now, and there are allies, and there are lots of supportive churches in Grand Rapids now, which there wasn't 20 years ago. I didn't have any other questions, but if there's something that mm -hmm. we haven't addressed that you wanted to speak to, you're more than welcome to add. Oh, I've, I've always felt really grateful to the LGBT community in Grand Rapids, because when I came, not knowing much about HIV and not knowing a whole lot about the LGBT community, and coming in and kind of taking their issue that they, they let me in and trusted me. And it took a while for us all to figure out that we were all in the same battle, but it was such a source of support for me to know I had friends there who would stick up for me and, and, and say, well, she's not like other straight women or, or other church women. And it was just a real gift to be let into that community and um, around HIV in the bad old days when there was nothing to do but watch people die. It was tremendously important and gratifying that when we came in in the last months or maybe year of someone's life, but we were really became an important part of their lives, that when the person died, we were so central, you know, that they're family and their friends embraced us and gave us more credit than we deserved probably for helping that person, but to become so important to someone who had a full life, had maybe had 30, 40 years, and we were only there the last six months, but to become important to them was very gratifying to all of us who worked in HIV. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. You're welcome.